Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Maya Jasanoff, and it gives me great pleasure today to introduce Redmond O'Hanlon. Uh, now, if you Google Redmond O'Hanlon, you get two Wikipedia pages, one of which is for Redmond O'Hanlon outlaw, which I think seems like a reasonable uh, 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 sort of doppelganger for the other Redmond O'Hanlon, which you can find on Wikipedia, who is described as a scholar, a writer, and a traveler. There are a few places in the world that Redmond O'Hanlon has not visited in the last several decades. And there are a few places uh, to which many of us would like to follow him, particularly after reading his books. He has gone into the jungles of the Amazon, into the jungles of Borneo. He's gone to the North Atlantic on a trawler. He's made television programs tracing Darwin's journey on the Beagle and the adventures of travelers such as Richard Burton. And perhaps not surprisingly, some of these trips have been pretty horrible, hence the, my sense that many of us would rather visit these places vicariously by reading his books about them than take them ourselves. His books capture the, uh, the, the difficulties of his travels uh, with great perception, with great comedy, and sometimes at the expense of his fellow travelers. One of, his favorite, uh, one of my favorite books of his is In the Heart of Borneo, uh, which uh, describes a journey that he took looking for the, is it the rare white rhinoceros of Borneo uh, with the poet James Fenton, uh, who comes across as a, a rather uh, unfortunate character uh, to have uh, had the, the misfortune to accompany you. Um, and his writing uh, captures both this incredible sense of adventure, as I say, this kind of comic uh, uh, sense of mishap, but also with deep learning. Uh, uh, because before uh, Redmond became a travel writer, he was actually uh, uh, something of a scholar. He holds an MPhil and a PhD from Oxford, where he wrote on something which actually at the time in the 1970s was, I think, rather avant-garde, but is uh, absolutely uh, uh, of the moment today, namely the concept of science in English literature. And one of the through lines in his work uh, is a, a, a love for uh, natural history. So many of his books uh, trace uh, uh, journeys in pursuit of natural curiosity. This combination of natural curiosity uh, history, uh, excuse me, curiosity about the natural world and a literary impulse animate the journey which he will talk to us about today. He is one of a very small handful of people who have traveled both up the rivers of Borneo and up the river Congo in Central Africa. One of the other figures to have made both of these journeys was the novelist Joseph Conrad. And few uh, uh, non-Africans today, I think, approach Congo without knowing Conrad's novel, Heart of Darkness, which fictionalizes his own journey up the Congo River in 1890. Redmond's book, Congo Journey, describes a more recent travels uh, in the footsteps of Conrad uh, and on the trail of natural history. Uh, what he looked for and what he found will be the subject of his talk today, Congo Journey, Please join me in welcoming Redmond O'Hanlon, outlaw, writer, and scholar. Well, thank you very much. What a wonderful introduction. Now, I was named after the outlaw, um, and he, he, was, uh, he had an army. Well, in, those, uh, in Cromwell's time, in um, uh, Irish uh, terms, an army was about uh, 10 people. So. Uh, there's that. And then his death I don't like to think about too much because uh, Cromwell put a price on his head and his brother, his own brother, elder brother, was a bit short of cash. So in the night he took his head off and took it into um, the nearest city where uh, it was displayed on a pike. So, you know, only once a year do I like to think of Raymond O'Hanlon the outlaw. Now, <laughs> um, now, all you need to know about this is that Marcelin is the leading uh, scientist, head of conservation in the Republic, People's Republic of the Congo, um, then the same time as Tiananmen Square and the, uh, the gov government of the um, People's Republic were the first uh, country to send a congratulation to the Chinese saying, well done, at last you've, uh, you know how to treat your students. <laughs> Um, now, he's the one man who claims he's seen the Congo dinosaur. 
Um, but more important for our, our uh, needs, he, he's just, he slept with the schoolmaster's wife in the village of Macau, which is about two months' uh, journey from Brazzaville, um, upriver, and uh, well across a little bit of jungle. Uh, and he's really worried, because as he said to me, I am um, an English gentleman, so um, if I sleep with a woman who is not my wife, I take my wedding ring off. Uh, now this time, he's lost it, and he's very worried about it. Uh, Larry is my American photographer, he's a professor of animal behavior. Uh, Somali is the protective animal of this particular village. Every village has one. It's an imaginary animal, or on the border between subjective and objective, and of course in the Congo, there's absolutely no difference between the two. Um, now, Doku will meet. He's the most powerful sorcerer, I was told, between the northern Congo and uh, Senegal. And it's uh, spooky as could be because the, the normal speech in the Congo is deep, deep Bantu, as we all know, this wonderful bass voices. So, what do you do if you are a figure of special power? You speak in a falsetto. Um, now, I've made a bit of a mistake many months into this journey, and I've, I've asked for a fetish for my protection on the grounds that uh, I had many enemies in Oxford. Now, this is a dangerous game to play because I immediately worried if I did have any enemies in Oxford, and uh, I'm the kind of man who likes to be loved by everybody, including the milkman, so it was quite disturbing before I'd actually ever done anything. Now, um, so I'm going to be given the fetish. Uh, all these things happen at midnight, um, and uh, at midnight, Marceline whistled outside the tent. Thanks. Larry said to me, but I'll stay here if you don't mind. Redmond, no torches, Marceline whispered through the tent flap. I don't want anyone to see us. I pulled on my boots and followed him across the mud street. Marceline tapped twice on the hut door. It slid a body width to the left. We stepped inside and Doku shut it behind us. Looking 10 years younger than in the morning, he'd had a big sleep, I decided. Doku was barefoot, but still wearing his old black jacket, black shirt, and black trousers. Somali, he said, waving us to two low wooden chairs to the left of the fire in its grate of stones, and himself perching on a three-legged stool, the white mugs and a gourd ready on a little slatted table at his side. Mr. Redmond, he said, pouring out the cloudy white palm wine, Tonight I will answer your question about Somali. His voice was unofficial, almost intimate. Dr. Marcelin and Mr. Redmond, we are here to talk about important matters, deep things. There are powers I can give you. These powers will change your lives. Doku replaced the gourd in its wooden stand. He gazed slowly about the smoky little room as if reacquainting himself with something necessary and familiar in the red light of the fire, the orange-yellow glow of the palm oil lamp, or somewhere along the slatted shelves that ran round the walls, ranged with a confusion of smoke-blackened baskets, lidded gourds, pots, and pans. He studied two six-foot spears with broad, double-barbed iron points which rested against the back wall. He stared for hours, it seemed, at three small bundles of fur which hung above the lintel of the door. Somali is like the gorilla, he said, re-inhabiting himself, handing us the mugs of palm wine. He is like the gorilla. He is like the chimpanzee. He is like a man. And he is different from all three. He is hairless. He is beardless, his arms are longer than his legs. The three cuts he makes from left to right across a boy's back, 
The three cuts he makes from right to left, these cuts are longer than the wounds he leaves along the tops of that boy's arm. Marcelin stared at the floor. For the fetish, I said. How much? Doku looked straight at me. 10,000 francs, Marcelin nodded. I pulled out another 20 notes. Doku picked up the other two, pushed the wad into the breast pocket of his jacket, rose to his feet, and disappeared through the dark entrance to the inner rooms. Marcelin muttered, Redmond, it's your fault. You forced me to come here. All my life I've tried to avoid to be free. Doku stood in front of us, holding something wrapped in black cloth. He sat down, had laid the bundle carefully on the table beside him, folded back the near edge, and drew out a small elongated bag the size of a field vole, a string dangling from its neck. See, the power's working. Mr. Redmond, this is a fetish for your protection, he said, and gave it to me. It fitted into my palm. It felt warm. Perhaps there was another fire in the inner room. A ruff of blue cloth protruded from its bound neck, and its thick brown fur was rubbed smooth in places, revealing white skin. There are no special conditions, no food conditions attached to the use of that fetish, he said, refilling Marceline's mug. You may eat whatever you wish. But it is forbidden to cross water too often. That fetish, which you must never open, the fetish which you now hold in your hand, Mr. Redmond, it contains the finger of a child. The spirit of this child will protect you. The spirit will guard you from thoughts that are old and sad. The spirit will free you from disease. The fetish itself is secret. Your very closest male friends, the men who hunt with you, they may glance at it. Your wife may touch it, but if she washes her private parts with it, it will lose its power at once. Yes, I managed to say. Marcelin, drink, said Doku. Marcelin drank. Doku drew a seemingly identical bag of fur from the black cloth. Marcelin. This is not an ordinary fetish, he said, leaning forward on his stool, intent, his voice suddenly uneven, parched with emotion. Only I, Doku, have protection like this. It is mine, and I wish to give it to you. No, said Marcelin, drunk, pressing himself back in his chair. No, I don't want it. This fetish, said Doku, his hand trembling, it will protect you against your enemies, misfortune, everything. This fetish, it holds the trap breath of Somali. I've told you before, said Marcelin, his arms tight across his chest, his neck rigid. I've told you a hundred times, I don't want it. Doku closed his right hand over the fur. He thrust his fist into the right hand pocket of his jacket. He stumbled to his feet and stooped forward over Marcelin like a heron mantling a fish. Take it, the lake tally. You need my protection. Take it. Doku's fist, palm up, was level with Marcelin's chest. Doku opened his fingers. In the flat of his hand, something bright and yellow lay looped to the string at the neck of the fetish. Marcelin, barely breathing, his mouth half open, his eyes so wide they showed the whites, stared at Doku's palm. His right hand, stiff as the hand on a sorcerer's doll, detached itself from the edge of his seat, reached up, and took the fetish and the wedding ring. Good, said Doku, sitting down, drinking for the first time. His goiter roused itself, bobbed up with each swallow. I thought so. Here in Macau, we help each other. I helped her. She helped me. Her husband, the schoolmaster, he's a stranger. He's not from here. He's a teke from the plateau. She wanted a son. She wanted a son for Somali. 
Marcellani is coming, I said. I sent a spirit to meet you. I knew you were coming. I knew you were coming long before you came here in the body, in bodily form. But both of you, you must go now. You have my protection. I can do no more. I must sleep. Marcelin, I said, as we walk very slowly back across the street like old men. I don't understand. How can you give the schoolmaster's wife a son for Somali? You're not initiated. You don't have the scars. When I left Macau, I was too young. But that doesn't matter, because I have a special position, a special lineage. A special position? Marcelin turned to me. You really don't know, do you? Know what? Doku, he's my grandfather. I crawled into the tent, took off my boots and lay down. Larry stirred, he said. That old fraud, he didn't give you a damn thing, did he? Guessing in the dark where Larry's face was, I took the fetish out of my pocket, leaned over, and with a soft bag of monkey fur, gently brushed his cheek. Larry sat up and screamed. <laughs> well, some or other, I think I've still got the fetish. It's rather worn now. And I'm a I'm an evangelical atheist, but I haven't made any conversions. And it's just somewhere or other, I seem to carry my fetish about with me rather a lot. Now, here it is, as you see, more or less as described. And it does have a finger in it. Now, I like to think it's a monkey finger. Now, it was, it was x-rayed. It was x-rayed at Heathrow. And I could tell that the woman operating the machine was a genuine Bantu from the Congo. And she screamed. <laughs> so I think it's a genuine fetish. Uh, and look, if you have 10 children um, in the Congo, in that area, um, which is the only area I know about, you can be certain that certainly six will die. So one way of looking at it is there are an awful lot of fingers about. Every family has to give a child to the sorcerer. Um, but there's a nasty codicil to that. When I was filming for um, Dutch public television, we were filming in Gabon, in the capital, and every six years or so with the election, around 20 to 30 young men, it's always young men, disappear. Um, they're captured outside the, um, the schools, and... We know exactly what happens because once you've done what you're going to do to this poor boy, you throw the straggled remains back in the, in the sea and the current takes them straight around and onto this huge beach. And we interviewed parents there. Now, there's always a hole here, the blood is drained. You drink the blood of a young man, it gives you energy to contest the election. If you want to know what's gonna happen, you have to eat his eyeballs. It's, it's just... It's obvious to all of us. There is no theological gap between understanding the way of thought of Central Africa. Uh, that's it. We instantly know what's going on. Now, I think, um, well, before we cheer ourselves up by going to see the pygmies, who are wonderful atheists, here is the reason you need a fetish. Now, this is not a work of art, I think, but it could be, but it's, it's very horrible. Um, it's what's known as a hanging doll, or a doll's for almost everything you want to do to somebody. Now, to get Doku to bring this doll out, uh, you would have to pay him half your salary, and that's in chickens, so a lot of chickens uh, have to be very, very serious matter. Um, it's going to almost bankrupt you. You have to mean it. Um, but if you do, he will scrape the neck here. You can see it's been very well used. And then put the wood shavings 
with special herbs that only he knows about in the jungle and dry them on a big leaf and make them into a powder and then uh, he will send, he has about six wives, he will send his youngest wife, um, his prettiest wife, to the victim and always there's palm wine and he will slip, she will slip this little uh, powder into the victim's palm wine. Then the next day, Doku sends his oldest wife. She will go round and she delivers this terrifying message. Your palm wine has been tampered with. Now, sounds like nothing, but it's not. That's a curse. And a curse is infectious. Your friends won't talk to you. Nobody will. Uh, you're very, if you're very lucky and she loves you, your youngest wife will keep feeding you. Um, and, uh, well, your, your friends have worked with you in the plantation. I was going to say your school friends, but there's no school. They walk straight past you. You mustn't look at somebody who's been cursed. And when I eventually, a long time, got back to Oxford, I talked to Anthony Storr, the psychiatrist, about it, and I said, well, I was told these poor men who have cursed they die within four months. And you did indeed see people lying outside their huts. And Storr said, yes, that's exactly right. That's the same in the West. It's the same everywhere. Untreated, acute depression kills you within four months. Um, I suppose the equivalent here would be, uh, well, you go into work one day, and the boss says, oh, come in, come into the office. And uh, so, there you are, and he says, look, uh, your contract of employment, I can't actually fire you, but I would love it if you went away for uh, at least a year. You see, we'd all be so much happier because you stink. Now, here is this pile of money, and I've, oh yeah, well I forgot, but your wife has given exactly the same amount, because she says that, oh well, uh, your children are so happy until they hear your key in the door. It has to be a double hit. Um, now this, you say, why have I got this? Well, the answer, it's a very, it's, it's a good system. You can't fault it logically. Here are 12 knots. Each knot is somebody who's hanged themselves. No idea how old this is, but probably very old. Uh, so 12 victims. And then one of them said, no, Doku, you know, piss off. Uh, nothing wrong with the whole system, just this doll had run out of energy. So it's the doll's fault always. I got this doll for six chickens. <laughs> but uh, anyway, let's cheer ourselves up. See if we can go and have a look at the, uh, the pygmies. I hope an image is going to emerge from somewhere. There must be a gin on my side. Any luck? Yes. Well, these are the barges that are tied together that go up the Congo River. Now it doesn't work because there's no more diesel, but they did then. Um, they're just ordinary, well, not ordinary, but vast iron barges from colonial times um, and their cables holding them together. And the trouble with uh, pictures, as you probably all know, I mean, they, they, they clean things up because you don't get the smell. There were 3,000 people on, this, on these barges and one loo. Well, uh, and there are gaps. And in the night, the babies uh, fall between the gaps and, uh, well, three did. Right, now this is uh, Marcelin's nephew, Enze. And this is the other side of, um, of the whole idea of sorcery. He has one eye that worked and the other is fastened on the moon or the floor depending on um, how it feels. So, that in effect, that means that he's blessed. Um, he has, he's been specially touched by God, the spirits. No, I'll say next. Can we go back one? 
No, that's forward, back. That's it. Now, he's fascinated by, uh, by the local animals. Anyhow, uh, and he told me that he, he, his uncle was a great, great sorcerer and had sewn a fetish into him here and there. And so whenever he got to one of these villages, and it seemed to be true, if he wanted the most beautiful girl in the village, all he had to do was go up to her and go, oof, and it worked every time. Uh, it may have had something to do with the fact that he, he played an instrument he'd made himself a bit like a sitar uh, beautifully. Um, that may have helped. Okay, next. Oh, I just like that picture because I look so thin and macho, and as you can see, I'm not anymore. <laughs> um, and we're discussing leaving the dugout behind, crossing over the watershed, to a village, uh, I'd always wanted to do that, an entirely different river system. Um, but the village was called Berenzoko, which means the village of the elephant hunters, and uh, it had no canoes, so it took a very long, long time. Next. Ah, now this is about six, six days walk inland, and, uh, well, they are such beautiful, happy, wonderful society. Um, why? Well, like all things, there's always a reason. Now, the reason is, I think, they are uh, probably living the same life as 100,000 years ago, plus maybe even 200,000, and probably the very first people to invent the net. They use a net for hunting, not for, not for fish, but uh, they peg it on the ground about this length, and then there is a hunt for the water chevrotain, the dick dicks, the dikers. Um, so an awful lot of meat and a lot of time for socializing, but you have to have a very, very long net. What does that tell you? That tells you every family has to get on with the next. You've all got to be there at the hunt. And I said, um, so what happens, what's, what's the punishment to social if uh, somebody really has behaved badly? And they said, oh, well, you just turn the entrance of his hut facing out into the darkness of the center of the jungle. And I said, um, when did that last happen? Then there was a discussion. It had happened um, in his grandfather's time. And I said, well, uh, how long does this terrible punishment last? So, said, oh, a day and a half. <laughs> so it, it just seems such a happy um, society, full of, uh, well, lots of food and full of dance. This wonderful dance we may see in a minute that probably also goes back 100,000 years. Uh, it certainly goes back way beyond um, the reign of the pharaohs. Pepe II uh, sent his, his general Herkouf to the south and he's the first man to describe, the first travel writer in a way, uh, to describe the pygmies, who he says are the little people who dance the dance of the gods beneath the great trees. And indeed that seems to be the case still. He also says they can uh, make themselves disappear into the center of the earth. And I sort of saw that too, the tremendous speed that the dancers revolve. And then, in the jungle itself, when you're walking, they stand so still that it uh, gives you the most terrible shock if they say something. They're invisible. It's true. And they can walk up to an elephant. To us, there's this tremendous uh, rank smell. You get used to it very fast. But they don't wash. So elephants seem to, they can't smell it. So you can go right up to a forest elephant and uh, spirit. So next one. Yeah, well, I sort of fell in love with these people. Uh, or rather, Larry said he did. And I said, yeah, well, of course you did. He said, no, no, I don't mean it like that. It's just, they're, look, look at the way they, they move their houses. They just make their houses, they got all the material goods, they just take it and move on to some other fucking place. <laughs> That's why he loved them. He was an engineer. And next. Now, this net, there's the hunting net I was talking about. Uh, and I think that boy's about eight years old, perhaps. He's got that uh, convex forehead of, of youth. And I tried lifting that net, 
and uh, I couldn't. These are mighty, mighty strong people. And you see he's got his spear there, and you can see the, the pegs to peg the net in. Next. Ah, well, here are the men waiting, again, probably waiting just like that for 200,000 years. They're waiting for the women, of course, waiting for the women to make themselves up. And, no, waiting for the women to arrive. <laughs> and you can see the net under the big plantain leaves. Next. Ah, now. I think, well, Larry was very upset and then he decided that actually we probably all behaved like that until we began to be farmers, when we began to look after even chickens as surrogate children. Before that, we would, uh, wouldn't bother to kill them before we cut them to bits. And so this is a diker in the nets and they just begin to butcher it without killing it first. That was the only, the only uh, detail in pygmy life that I would change. <laughs> And next, ah, now, you can't really say uh, no, no pygmy society, any of the groups, actually has uh, a sorcerer, somebody prepared to do bad, bad things for you. No. Um, you have a fetisher, a doctor, really, and very lucky, very rare to have an old woman, to have an old man or an old woman. Now, um, this wonderful guy, he was the sort of repository of the wisdom of, uh, of the group. And I had, a, I had a little problem. I wanted to see what he would do about it. Well, uh, another cousin of Marceline's called uh, Manu, he had terrible back pain, he said. No, he couldn't ever, he couldn't carry a pack. He could only just manage to carry a machete. Oh, God, his pain was bad. So. I said to him, can you, what do you do, what do you do about back pain? He said, oh, well, we, we can certainly help you with that next. Now, this is the operation. There's Manu, and uh, he's cut 18 times across the top of the back, which really, really hurts that, that bit, and then even more painful, across, um, as is happening now, with the one little bit of iron they had. Uh, and then... Um, Charcoal rubbed into the wounds, that hurts too. <laughs> and to keep his mind off the pain, they hit him really quite hard with that stick, do you see? And you'll be amazed, but, but it, it worked. This medicine worked. Man who never complained about back pain ever again. Ah, <laughs> uh, well, this is the man that all the girls wanted. Um, a super warrior, as you can see. He's just shinned up a tree, and without any kind of smoke or any uh, protection for himself, just dug out the honey from a bee's nest, and he's wrapping it up in uh, bees there. And then he will give the honey to his favorite girls. Right, next. Well, this is the dancing I was telling about every night till three or four in the morning. Wee, ooh, wee, ooh, wee, ooh. That's the the sound of the monkey eagle, um, and that's how they chant, and round and round with just the one drum. Um, but it is hypnotic. And the old, old woman there, do you see, with her hands down, every night she danced like that. She is holding the head of her eight-year-old son who died. So every night as she dances, she brings him alive. Next. Now, this is the handsome guy you saw. Uh, dressed up, he'd been, well, maybe 60 miles or so anyway, a great journey to the next door group of pygmies to get the knowledge of a dance. Um, there are real intellectual copyright. You have to pay a lot to get the knowledge of a dance. Um, and he had, and he brought it back with him. Um, and it's as if he had gone hunting. It made him even more desirable. And this is it's the dance of death. Now... You invite death in for a wonderful feast of diker meat, whatever. And you, you make him very, very drunk, if you can. And then you carry death out as far as you can into the jungle and leave him pointing the other way. And then no more death. So I'm, I'm all for it. I think it's a very good idea. Uh, and as you can see... Actually, you can't see the speed that he's revolving, but 
I'd only, we were only allowed to take two flash pictures then, and then there was chaos. And now his, do you see, he's wearing a, a gorilla skull on top of his skull. That's uh, um, all part of the dance, and the leaves are very necessary. Next. Oh, and then eventually we got right across. And I swear to you, in my dreams, I'd say it's a myth. It's absolutely not true that the pygmies are tiny people. No, no, no. They were much taller than me, and they still are in my dreams. Because he, Muko, looked after me. I think that's how it works in the mind. He knew everything. But for him, I'd have been dead many times over, of course. So he was the big hero. And if you did exactly what he said, you were OK. But I suppose it's a good thing I've got that picture. They are very small. Um, and also, ground under. He's just arrived in a village. And the Bantu uh, say they really do treat the pygmies as, as their slaves. And it's the one Achilles heel of uh, pygmy life. You get this fantastic craving for starch, carbohydrates. Get all the meat you want. Uh, and so they go to a village and they work in the plantations um, and they have to wear these terrible shoes they're given. Next. Ah, uh, now this, this is here because this is the one piece of architecture that Larry really, really admired. He said, oh my God, look at that. Um, this is the house for the dogs at night. They're driven up into their lot. Uh, and then you hear oh, oh, terrible screaming dogs. And then in the background you hear oh, oh, oh. now that's the leopard. And I really wouldn't want to be a dog there. Because as maybe you all know, but every leopard, probably here too, every leopard uh, really likes to eat dog. They specialize, so one leopard will only eat uh, forest crocodiles um, or dikers or whatever. But given the chance, every leopard thinks dog is the very best sort of meal. <laughs> so there are tr you can't see them here, but there are tremendous scratch marks on those poles. Next. Oh, well, if I'd known, this is... Uh, Extensiline 140p injection protects you for life. But this is the home of yours, which is uh, it's, uh, a spirochete carried by on the feet of flies and uh, starts obviously everywhere in the, in the wet areas, like mucus. And under the microscope, you can't tell the difference between that and the syphilis spirochete. So, um, this is nothing whatever to do with sex, though. And after, well, a year or so of painfulness and ugliness, it falls off. But uh, it's a terrible thing to see anyway. So being a pygmy is not always wonderful. Next. Ah, now this is working the plantation. This is just an ordinary tropical ulcer, but it's gone right through. It went right through to your stomach lining. And all I had was one course of general antibiotics I had to give him and Savlon and wrapped it up. So that's another reason not to be a pygmy. Next. Next one. Ah, oh, this is uh, many months later. Um, and actually starting to look for the Congo dinosaur, so-called. Now, there are a lot of stories about it. Um, and uh, one is... When you go to Lake Telly, if you hear this strange noise, ooh, 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 you're dead. You're going to die. That's it. Ow. Um, we set off and, uh, well, it took five days. <coughs> got to next, got, finally got to Lake Telly. And there it is. And this is the first time I've seen Rest for the eyes, the horizon, the space. Uh, extraordinary feeling. And certainly, I thought, looked a prehistoric lake. This is where you're going to find um, a sauropod dinosaur, if you're going to find one anywhere. And, well, my wife said, yes, but that could be a lake in Switzerland. So that was very sad. <laughs> um, 
and it's it's big elliptical. Anyway, the next one. Now, we covered ourselves and heard some chimpanzees woof, woof, uh, in the distance. Covered ourselves in mud, crept forward, and I got right underneath a tree uh, where there's a very old chimp, and he was bald, and he he looked down, he saw me, I moved, and. He just thought it was the most disgusting thing he'd ever seen in his life. So he stood up and he held these two branches and uh, he, he peed on me. I was soaked. You know, you feel very, very unwelcome. And then, quite unnecessary, he, he swung around and he'd been eating a lot of fruit. It was a real shower of pellets. And then he went, he got these branches and he went, ooh, wah! Uh, and then I realized these black, black shapes coming down the trees. Lots of young chimpanzees. Now, they should be running away, not a bit of it. They're coming down the tree quite slowly, and then they hit the ground, and they're whacking the ground, and water flying up. Um, really scary. And then I thought of uh, Jane Goodall's idea. She writes about a chimp's idea of a great day out. You go and get a colobus, you grab it by the ankles, and you whack its head on a tree, and then eat its brains. Its brains are delicious. And I could see that's exactly what they were thinking. And then the two guys with me stood up and, and they whacked the tree with their machetes and they walked off. So, but they looked round as if to say, look, you come here next time. You come, come, come here again and, and we'll have you. <laughs> uh, so they're big, big, impressive animals. And we got back to camp and there was Enzi Manu sitting there and they said, did you hear it? Did, did you hear it call? We're going to die. And then I said, yeah, of course. Ooh, it's the sound of chimpanzees carried over open space. It's the biggest open space for hundreds of miles in every direction. And they wouldn't have it. Then they said, you're not going to be able to buy the bicycle that you promised us. <laughs> uh, anyway, next one. Yes, well, that's uh, uh, Vicky, the chief's son, um, and the next, these were the two tough guys with me. The next one, yeah, they, you see, every now and then you have to wait uh, because there is a cursed area, a taboo area. Now, I think this is probably because every single villager in that village has died. Why? Because they cut down some bat roost. They've been hit by Ebola. They've been hit by all kinds of retroviruses. So next. Ah, uh, well, that's just because it's very rare to see flowers. Um, that's just uh, because everything in a jungle flowers whenever it wants to. So you, you never have a great display. Next. Next one. Yeah, well. This is a little gorilla. We've almost finished now. This is little gorilla I adopted because, again, there's no mystery about it. If you want to be tough, if you've got to fight somebody, if you want to murder somebody, then you must get strong. And how do you get strong? You eat gorilla meat, and that makes you strong. So an awful lot of gorillas uh, are killed, and the little ones are taken back into the village, and the kids play with them. Um, and it's always the mother, I'm afraid, because the father, he sleeps at the bottom of a tree and he scoots off, he's gone. Uh, and so the mother is speared, cut up into steaks, and I fell for this little gorilla. Look, um, we fell in love. And he's drinking from his, he liked that blue cup. Now, even at that age, he's so strong. I knew what was coming, there's absolutely nothing I can do about it. And he grabs, when he's halfway down his mug, he grabs it and he goes, Oom! and then he goes, <laughs> and that's how a gorilla laughs. <laughs> Next one. Ah, uh, well, I got him out to Brazzaville. Yeah, right on top of his head there. Well, it's much improved wearing nappies, but he smelt of fresh leaves right on top. Um, yeah. We, he had diarrhea, I had diarrhea, and we slept wrapped up together, and nobody would come near us during the last month or so, which was terrific. <laughs> now, next one. Now, there was one other 
ape in this, in this uh, enclosure, and uh, a pygmy, a pygmy chimpanzee, bonobo. Now, they are very bright. They're a quantum leap, I'm afraid, above a gorilla. But this time, the bonobo has made a mistake, as you see. It's a category mistake. He's, he's, he's whizzed up this sapling, and he said something like, you are never going to go to Harvard, like Maya. And Redmond uh, on the ground there is uh, rightly annoyed. Next. But you see, he's, Bonobo has made a mistake because Redmond is a lot stronger. Next. Got it. And I think that's, yeah, there he is. Yeah, fell in love with him and sent him postcards and nappies. And, well, one silly story that I got uh, a card saying he died, and he died. Um, they get all our diseases. They're incredibly uh, emotional. He died of a, of a burst ulcer. He got an ulcer because too many other orphan gorillas, also very disturbed, had come into this place that he really thought obviously was his own. And uh, yeah, he died. So that morning, Anyway, I was caught speeding doing 60 and a 30 mile an hour limit. I had to go to uh, a court in Ealing and write, uh, my case was the last case. At the end of the day, I'm in my suit. Um, and the old magistrate leans forward on his table and he says, Dr. Hamlin, have you got any excuse for your disgraceful behavior that day? And I said, well, my Lord, Normally I drive like an old man, but that morning I just heard that the gorilla I slept with in the Congo had died. <laughs> and the policeman started, he forgot he was meant to be a policeman. And he bent forward, howling with laughter, there was chaos in the court. And then he banged the magistrate and said, silence, silence in the court, that's the most ridiculous excuse I've heard in all my time. <laughs> and so I got a fine of 30, 30 pounds. Everybody else was sent to prison and executed. And yeah, I was very lucky. So, thank you. Well, I think we can add a uh, voice actor to the list of uh, credentials, outlaw, writer, traveler, adventurer. Um, we have time for just a few questions. I think there should be mics going around. I'm going to uh, take the moderator's prerogative and ask just one to kick things off. So I mentioned at the outset uh, Joseph Conrad, who, uh, whose heart of darkness hangs over uh, river journeys in Congo for, for outsiders to Africa. And as you'll know, Conrad has been challenged for uh, racist portrayal of Africa. And one of the things that people um, take him to task for or, 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 or say as a reason not to read uh, Conrad now um, is that the Western narratives about Africa often tend to privilege uh, some of the things that you've told us about. So we've had here uh, sorcery, um, we've had your talking to us about pygmies, which is a word given to the native peoples of the Aturi forest by uh, Westerners in the 19th century. Um, we've had uh, tales of death and deprivation, uh, and uh, we've had more um, human touches, in a sense, given to animals than, uh, than to many other actors. So I just wondered how you would respond to some of the discussion that's had about the kinds of stories that we tend to tell as outsiders about Well, Africa wasn't it Chinua Achebe? Anyway, it's the most ridiculous thing to call Conrad a racist. Absolutely not, if you read Heart of Darkness properly. He's, uh, he's completely, um, he's completely at one with the people there, but, He's also seeing it, and you have to think of things in, uh, in terms of history. Yes, it's a great good thing that we change it, but he's thinking in terms of evolution, and uh, the thought then was that we had all come from Africa, as indeed we have, but that you had to be very careful. You had to hang on to your Western values when you were in such a place, because after the first edition of Darwin and the Origin of Species, uh, he talks about habit and uh, use and disuse. He, he forgets about or abandons evolution by natural selection. So that means in practice that 
you will be sucked into your surroundings. If you're not strong enough, if you're not disciplined, uh, which is why you have to have cold baths in a public school and so on, it all fits together. Uh, you've got to keep a grip on yourself or you will become a broken down colonial and you want to live there because the surroundings have got you at the right level in your unconscious. So it's a very easy, silly thing to say that he was racist. Of course he wasn't. And he, um, the whole thrust of Heart of Darkness is anti the Belgian racist. Um, that's what it's for, that's what's motivating him. Audience questions. Hello, uh, you mentioned that uh, life hasn't changed over the uh, over uh, 200,000 years. What is the situation now? Have they, has life changed for them now? Because I think the uh, can you tell me? I can. The question was uh, that you mentioned that things had not changed for 100,000 years in these societies. Uh, yeah. So what is the situation now? Um, I say that because it looks as if that way of life, I mean, in fact, they're called the Babinga, but if I was going to talk to you about the Babinga and Mabuti and give the names of all the various, uh, um, you know, they're homo sapiens sapiens. Um, and we, the, the, the actual word in the English language is pygmies. There's nothing derogatory about it. The little people, whatever you like. Anyway, um, yes, it does seem that their way of life, you could imagine that, a hundred thousand years ago. Um, but things like nets, you see, do not survive in the fossil record. Not only that, but uh, skeletons in the rainforest, they don't survive either. So it's pretty obvious to me that's where we all come from. And then we didn't leave the rainforest, rainforest left us. Uh, and it, uh, we were the other side of the Rift Valley. In the back there. Um, I just wanted to find out uh, your comments on King Leopold's reign, which is much, much worse than, than the Holocaust or any other massacres. What kind of an imprint did his reign leave on the people around the, in your travels? The question was about King Leopold's uh, domain in Congo and what impact, if any, you saw of his... Uh, uh, rule on the people that you encountered? Uh, yes, it's still there, I'm afraid. Um, in all kinds of fragmentary, uh, horrifying ways, saying that, and there's this leading question, do you like frankfurters? I have to, what, why, yes. And the, uh, the, the reasoning behind it was, white men love eating fingers, and now it's frankfurters. That is... The only reason anybody could think of for why Leopold's men cut off fingers from people who hadn't brought in enough rubber into the uh, jungle stations. Yes, it's still there. You mentioned that Manu often saved your life. Could you tell us about a time when Manu saved your life? Um, yes. Well, the, the most terrible thing, in a way, that can happen to you is, is, sim is simple, all these simple things, like getting lost. Now, you go out, say, for a pee, and you think you're only 20 yards away, so you walk back where you think the camp is, but you're walking another 20 yards away, and then panic sets in, and it gets ever worse, and eventually you die. There, there's just no ready fruit in the jungle. You have to know exactly what you're doing. You have to know which vine to drink from. Um, it's, a, it's, it's strange, it, it's so rich, but it's a very easy place to, to die. So that's the main, main thing. In fact, I went out uh, with the gorilla and um, well, I'd forgotten my compass and out in the jungle suddenly realized that I was lost. And then, that's why Vicky's um, image was there, Vicky the chief's son. Everybody loved him, but he beat his wives and they would scream. Nobody seemed to care a bit. 
And this was the only time I was really glad to hear uh, that uh, somebody beating their wife and they scream, and that's the only reason I could get back to the village. <laughs> Horrible. Um, your story about the uh, orphan gorilla was very touching. Uh, can you give us an idea from your travels whether there's any future for wildlife in Africa in, say, the next hundred years, except in highly protected areas uh, manned by former members of the SAS? Ha. Yes, I agree. Um, the real answer to your question is if you cannot involve the local people and make sure they get an income from it, um, the parks themselves are not going to last. Luckily, in the, uh, the part of the rainforest I was in, in the Congo, there were no roads, nothing. You can't get in there. So uh, the forest elephant actually was quite um, numerous. Uh, but, I mean, all I saw was about a square inch of the rear end of a forest elephant as it reared out of a bush and got away. Now. Marcelan, who was with me, the head of conservation, he's in charge of protecting the elephants. And his, his maternal uncle, now the maternal uncle to us, so what? It's, that's the, the man who runs your whole family, your extended family. Why? Well, if you think about it, it's pretty obvious. It's because only the maternal uncle uh, is sure that you are related to him because uh, only the woman knows, uh, it's only your mother, you could be certain, is actually genetically related to you. Um, he was the most famous poacher in the Congo. And we met him and he had great piles of ivory and a massive arsenal. So in that area, uh, oh well, it's a terrible, sad story to think about. But if you can motivate people to bring in tourists, it's all going to depend on eco-tourists. It's going to depend on us, I'm afraid, to bring in the money, and then the animals will be protected. It does seem to work in East Africa. And the guy, you know, when I said you, he'd, he'd, um, he'd shot a rare heron, I said, you shouldn't do that, and, uh, and a gorilla. And then I said to the guy who killed the gorilla, you really, uh, I mean, I was out of it by then, you really shouldn't do that sort of thing. He said, well, how, what the hell, you, you? You come from a rich country, you must have thousands of gorillas in your garden. <laughs> um, education, it's all very well to say, uh, and how wonderful if they could be educated in science. It's the vast expense, we have to remember. How could you possibly get through life without some kind of structure. And there's no, there's no chance of you getting a scientific education or any education at all. Um, Manu said to me what he'd like to have back from, from the West was a book. And I said, well, what sort of book? And he said, a book, <laughs> any book. I think books is a wonderful note on which to end this discussion. I want to thank you all for making the trek to the Samvad uh, and to beyond to Congo and to thank Redmond for taking us there. Thanks very much. Well, I've been to hundreds and hundreds of festivals, of course, and this is, uh, this is stupendous, quite extraordinary. My first visit here, wonderful. Thank you for coming. Gentlemen, Redmond O'Hanlon and Maya Jasnoff, thank you very much. Um, Mr. O'Hanlon will be available to sign your copies of the book that you can also purchase in the book signing area. The tent stopped with orange and